Welcome to Killer Hope, live from Sundance 2011. I'm Christine Vachon. And I'm Ted Hope. And we are here with Lance Weiler. Transmedia guru. <laughs> what the hell does that mean? What's transmedia? Uh, to me, it means just telling stories, you know, breaking the fourth wall and telling them across whatever makes sense. You know, it could be in the real world, it could be across mobile, online, um, you know, traditional media. It's just kind of moving more in turn with media consumption changes and, and kind of looking at the connected world that we live in. You're here in the frontier section mm -hmm. and you have a short film and they're connected and you're creating a pandemic in Park City. Yes, yeah, it's, it's a, quite literally a storytelling pandemic. Um, the idea, I wanted to come and kind of do a story R&D effort. Uh, I was very interested in, like a lot of films will come here and they'll, they'll be completed and they'll be looking to sell. I'm interested in how stories can be kind of researched and developed over time and how you can engage audiences more earlier in the process and, and, and kind of get them involved. And participate. Totally, yeah. yeah. So, so what, give us a little lay of the land of what pandemic is here. Sure, um, over the course of 120 hours, people online and in the real world here work together to stop a pandemic. Um, and what that means is we've planted 50 uh, golden objects throughout Park City. And uh, also we have these 50 Google phones that are hand cranked, that are passed from one person to the next with certain simple instructions. And across all that activity, we have like a mission control space you can go down into and you can watch all the data points as they come live. You know, and you can see the whole thing play out and there's a surface table where you can touch it and kind of very minority report kind of thing. Uh -huh. And then the people that take the... <laughs> Totally, and then the people that take the phones and bring them back because they've been passed from one person to the next, you set them down on the table, you see all the media that's associated with everybody, all the photographs, all the video that's been shot, and it all comes up and you can go through it. And um, a lot of it is about kind of, you know, putting people in the shoes of the protagonists, you know, basically. Right. You know, it's kind of playing off the timeline that there's effectively like an outbreak of a virus here and in other places, a strange yeah. sleep virus. I got hold of one of the phones and it asked me the question, you know, th there is a, a, a starving person, but you know they're, they're infected. Do you, do you help them out or do you run away? Yeah, we... we I'm not going to tell you what I did, but... Because at the, at the core on the other side of it is we have this narrative that we're playing with, but then the, a lot of the data points we're actually applying to uh, the fight of actual pandemics and disease. So the morality questions were actually developed specifically because during a pandemic, uh, morality questions will change in right. the light of knowing what's actually happening in a situation. And so uh, we're working with Medic Mobile and also with Freedom Lab out of Amsterdam, and there was a lot of interest in what that would mean in a social environment like Park City. And then in addition to that, kind of looking and saying, okay, there's a vertical that they're always trying to figure out. Two people might have something that each of them knows something that's valuable, but they don't know how to connect. So we're playing with that with like the phones and some of the other things we're doing. So how much, how much preparation do you have to do to, um, to launch something like that here? And, and how big of an operation do you have to have? How many people? Uh, we probably have a crew of close to 40 people, um, a lot of which are, it's different roles. You know, we have programmers, uh, you know, uh, lead developers. We're not too dissimilar to how you would work on a crew and you'd have right. your DP or you have a gaffer or whatnot. But you're and, sort of making it here. Yes, yeah, we're making it here and we have like 20 actors that are out doing different things and all their, all their scripting has been done through Twitter. You know, so like we literally script each day. It's a five act structure across five days. Um, and uh, we script each of them with like a certain number of tweets and then we kind of let them go in between those and we capture it you know on video we capture you know short installational things with them and um, and, and kind of create this really cool tapestry of a story that's unfolding at the same time but all of this happening here is only a, a piece of a much bigger project that you're working you developed a script mm -hmm. hope is missing yes at the Sundance lab no relation to you <laughs> I'm right here. He's right here. <laughs> Damn it! I'm right here, um, and I must confess, I am producing that movie. Yes, yes. But uh, how, do, how does what you're doing here fit into the, the the bigger world of the feature? Sure. Well, I think what's really exciting right now is there. You know, the traditional is kind of shaking. You know, there there are no rules anymore in terms of how you can create. You know, so what I'm interested in is creating a universe. So pandemic kind of represents in a timeline when the initial outbreak first happens. And everybody's like, oh my God, what's going on? There's first few days. Yeah, there's this crazy sleep virus. It's only affecting adults, you know, and the youth are left to their own devices. And then the feature film comes in like 90 days later. But with the serialized content, we're doing it, like uh, we shot some that uh, is actually in the US uh, shorts side. Um, and then we're doing it in London and 
Berlin and Barcelona and Rome so, and Paris. So wherever someone happens to discover this, they'll have a localized version that kind of speaks to yes. them in their native language, in their native environment. Yeah, yeah. And because it, it, I think what's really interesting about it is it's kind of like I have this theory around contextual storytelling. We live in this world that's all about data now. You know, like a lot of people don't know, but they come in contact with it all the time. And I'm interested in how it can trigger uh, story elements. It can make things more personal for people. It can connect people in interesting ways and bridge between the fragmentation that we're in right now, between devices. You know, when you sit down in a living room, you know, oh, I'm going to watch television. When you go to the theater, you know, I'm going to... You know, I'm going to watch a film, but uh, there's a lot of gaps there. You know, how does story really, per, you know, kind of travel? And so I'm interested in those story bridges between things and how you kind of design for that. And, and in some ways, you know, social media is an early phase of that. But I feel like, you know, as filmmakers start to develop more of a storytelling abilities with these new tools, uh, you'll start to see people move away from such literal translations of a one-to-one -one relationship of like, oh, this is what Twitter has to be. This is right. what Facebook has to be. And then move into... You know, almost like where, ironically, some of the audience already is, you know. Well, one of the things I found fascinating about your approach is that you do invite the outside in. You do ask the, the crowd to participate, and you're not fixed on the result that you want. That, that you introduced me to a... a phrase uh, emergent gameplay of not actually knowing what the the game is as you release the game yeah well the emergent gameplay is an interesting concept because it's kind of like you you know you you kind of let it out there and they the players take it and they do what they want with it you know and they lead you places that you never but that expected. sounds like what you're doing here anyway it is it's very much that but i, I also like the idea of how transmedia can be tied back into you know, the development of a project. You know, a lot of people think of it just solely as like marketing promotion. Right, right, you know, But right. it's really like arguably, I think, an amazing way to, 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 you know, rehearse with people, with actors. I think it's a great way to develop work. I think those other things naturally come with it, you know, but uh, I think it's, it's kind of neat. You know, I think in some ways it's kind of a, a storytelling form for the 21st century. I, you know, when I've always, always thought of movies as a finite thing, a movie that began and end and ended and unfolded in a very particular order. And I had a dream, you know, what, what is the movie that won't leave you alone, that, that you can't ever escape from? And when, when I uh, first encountered your work, uh, you know, with, with head trauma, the, the kind of the tale that you told was precisely that, a film that would haunt you much longer than you planned. Tell us a little bit about what that was. Yeah, well, I think like I've been exploring this area for a while, even before there was a term necessarily for transmedia or alternate reality games. And, and I think it was just out of that desire to not be dictated by a format. You know, there were certain ways I wanted to create, and I didn't want to necessarily be locked into a box. And so where it came time to uh, release Head Trauma, I had taken it out uh, theatrically myself, had released it on DVD, and then I decided I was going to kind of recontextualize it. And I actually put it out into live experiences where people could come, and we remixed it live with musicians and DJs. We had characters emerge from the audience and scare people, very William Castle-esque style. But then we also wrote software, you know, and software, for instance, when somebody actually made it their way to the venue, we rang all the pay phones up and down the block, you know, and then when they kind of came legal? around. No, it's not legal. And then when they kind of came, <laughs> when they came around, they'd see a street preacher and he'd have a, you know, be preaching fire and brimstone. He'd have like a comic. And if they held it up to the light, there were all these ciphers and things in it. And then we wrote software that allowed people to interact with the movie in real time with their phones. So characters, you know, it was kind of a meta narrative place there. But I think the part where it became really exciting was like afterwards when the movie actually followed them home. You know, and then when they would sit down and they, they, they'd uh, go to the site and they'd type it in and they'd see a, a really great interactive what, comic. What was the uh, site? Because it's still up, right? It's archived now at uh, headtraumamovie.com. But um, they would go in and, and, and we would know they were there. We'd initiate a phone call back to them and, <laughs> and, and put them in the shoes of the protagonist, you know, and they'd be getting these crazy calls. So the phone would actually ring? The phone would totally ring. They'd answer it. It was all, it was all sound designed. It wasn't an actual person. It was all automated, built to scale. And whatever they said into the phone, you know, uh, would trigger video and audio on their screen. And this is like 2007. Um, and then there would be a part where the, the character would say, you know, tell me something dark about yourself. And whatever they said into the phone, we would actually loop back over their computer speakers, totally freak them out. And they'd be trying to get out of it, you know, and we built like a, <laughs> built like a fake exit box. And we knew they were doing that. And then we'd deliver a message back to the phone that said, where do you think you're going? You know, and there's no escape. No escape. 
That's what this show is going to be like. <laughs> you can't get away from it. Yeah. So I, I think it's very exciting, you know, when you kind of let yourself kind of go out there and explore because the stuff that you get back from the audience and, and when you, you know, because it's major changes in authorship right now, you know, and, and how they want to be involved in a storytelling sure. process. So it's like, how do you find the right balance of that? Um, the, it leads to some exciting things. So you feel that the world has completely changed in terms of storytelling? I, I, I don't know if it's completely changed. Ironically, I think it's just going back to a time where it was like around a campfire and anybody had control over a story. They had the ability to embellish it. You know, right, so like right. the, you know, the permission-based culture of it is kind of eroding away. Right. You know, so. Exciting times. Thank it's you, Lance, for coming thank you. in. Thanks for having me, guys. Appreciate it.